The Chilcot report doesn't whitewash Britain's biggest intelligence failure in decades. It quotes an MI6 officer saying the service marketed intelligence before checking it. It indicates that the MI6 chief, Sir Richard Dearlove, over-relied on an agent who was believed to be lying about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction even before the war began. This intelligence was shared with Number 10, but not with experts at the Ministry of Defence. Chilcott even suggests this Hollywood movie, The Rock, may have inspired MI6's source to invent a claim about a glass container full of chemical weapons. Do you like the Elton John song, Rocket Man? And this morning, Sir John was about as blunt as civil servants get. The judgments about the severity of the threat posed by Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, WMD, were presented with a certainty that was not justified. Chilcott documents pressure from Jack Straw, then the Foreign Secretary, to strengthen a public document on Iraq's WMD threat. Should not Iraq be first and also have more text, he commented. The paper has to show why there is an exceptional threat from Iraq. It does not quite do this yet. But Chilcott accuses nobody of lying. Intelligence and assessments were used to prepare material to be used to support government statements in a way which conveyed certainty without acknowledging the limitations of the evidence. The Chilcot inquiry does not directly accuse 10 Downing Street of sexing up intelligence for political advantage. Instead, it says responsibility for the intelligence assessment lay with John Scarlett, the head of the Joint Intelligence Committee, a committee which it says did not even consider whether Saddam might not have weapons of mass destruction at any stage. John Scarlett then became the chief of MI6, to the anger of many of his colleagues, an appointment which might seem all the more remarkable today. Khan Ross was one of only two Foreign Office officials we know resigned over Iraq, and he welcomed Chilcot's findings. I was very worried it would be a whitewash, or, or that the recommendations and the insights would be presented with a sort of lack of clarity and an opaqueness that perhaps the Butler Review did. I think it's very clear, it's very emphatic. So I think, you know, air has been cleared, it's not, I would put it in other terms, you know, the truth has finally been unarguably established. The Chilcot report is no less damning about what happened after the invasion than before it. It says Mr Blair agreed to send three combat brigades to Iraq without senior ministers meeting to discuss it. That the Americans gave the Prime Minister just eight days notice that the war was about to begin. And that when Mr Blair set out his vision for Iraq in March 2003, no assessment had been made of whether that vision was achievable, no agreement had been reached with the US on a workable post-conflict plan, UN authorization had not yet been secured, and there had been no decision on the UN's role in post-conflict Iraq. Despite explicit warnings, the consequences of the invasion were underestimated the planning and preparations for Iraq after Saddam Hussein were wholly inadequate. The government failed to achieve its stated objectives. Chilcott says British diplomats had little or no formal role in critical decision making, including America's decision to disband the Iraqi army, with UK strategy far too reliant on talks not between officials, but between Tony Blair and George Bush. Britain, all the way through this process, wasn't really taking responsibility. It didn't really feel it was in charge. It was hiding behind the fact it was part of a coalition. So a lot of the conversations, and you can see this going all the way through the Chilcot report, are people saying, oh, we thought the US was going to do that, or we were hoping the UN were going to step in and do that. It took four years before the Ministry of Defence finally ordered patrol vehicles, which gave British troops extra protection from roadside bombs. British military commanders are accused of being far keener on getting out of Iraq than stabilising it. Between 2003 and 2009, the UK's most consistent strategic objective in relation to Iraq was to reduce the level of its deployed forces. The risk is that at 2.6 million words long, no minister or civil servant will actually read today's report. But its message, simply put, is this. Don't go to war unless you challenge the intelligence first and unless it's clear what you can achieve.